On this episode of What's Going On With Shipping, the Port of Los Angeles' Gene Soroka breaks down the state of shipping in the United States. Better call Sal. Hi, I'm the aforementioned Sal McCoggleland, and welcome to this episode. So, I got a couple of notes about Gene Soroka hitting the news, a uh, report on, of him on Bloomberg, and another one with him on CNBC's Squawk Box. So, I'm going to look at that Squawk Box video. It's the shorter of the two. I'll have the link to both of them in the show notes so you can hear what Gene has to say about this. This comes right at the time when the ILWU, the International Longshore Warehouse Union, and the Pacific Maritime Association just put out a press release talking about that the press knows nothing about what's going on in the contract negotiations and all is well in the contract negotiations. So obviously that tells me nothing's going right. But anyway, we'll go to see what Gene has to say. If you're new to the channel, hey, take a minute, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell, so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. All right, let's go ahead and jump into this. Better call Sal. All right, I hadn't watched this video yet, so I'm kind of excited to hear what Gene has to say. Now, Gene is the executive director for the Port of L.A., so he's the landlord for the tenants that operate. L.A. and Long Beach are ports that are side by side. They were the focus of the supply chain crisis for the past two years. This is the port that had 109 ships at one point anchored off its port. Now the issue has changed dramatically, so let's hear what Gene has to say. Ports on the West Coast are seeing some softness in cargo volume this year. In January, the Port of Los Angeles reported that imports dropped 13% year over year. It's warning of a significant volume decline this month. Joining us now is Gene Soroka. He's a Port of Los Angeles executive director. And first of all, I just, I, I can't wait to, to have you sort of, I've looked at some of the notes on what's happening, but it's not the way I thought things would be going. So I, I don't know why he doesn't think it would be going that way. Uh, we saw the downturn happening. We know that early in the year, particularly January and the February, are very slow months, and we're coming off the back end of COVID. So not really surprised that we, you know, you're seeing a downturn, but we'll let him explain. A lot of it has to do, you're really getting a lot of competition from East Coast and Gulf, and Gulf ports, but the reopening of China hasn't helped boost volumes, why not? So the competition has been going on for a long time. COVID actually brought business into LA and Long Beach, but if you look at the period before COVID, LA and Long Beach were losing out, the West Coast entirely was losing out to the East and Gulf Coast of the United States. Saw so a lot of trade shifting there, and I'll explain why in a minute. Ah, uh, good morning, Joe. And this economic equation is more complex than I've you've seen. seen. Yeah, yeah, why? First quarter, uh, volumes down precipitously, coming off all-time highs, but you still got really high retail inventory levels. Inventory sales ratio about 1.35, 1.37. You're getting emails and texts every day with deep discounts from retailers, and if you're like me, you're buying. But that inventory level remains elevated. Second, the reopening of China is one piece to it, but the central government and the ports, like the Yangshan Deep Seaport in Shanghai, continue to prioritize that long leg cargo. So we never saw a tremendous dip, even though there were pressures on the domestic supply chain, land transport, barge service, et cetera. That cargo kept coming. And it's the trepidation about the economy. So not only are inventory levels high, but importers are trying to cut back just a little bit more. And with all of that, we saw an extended Lunar New Year break of about 30 days compared to right. seven to 10 as normal. We Okay, so a couple of things on what Gene was just talking about there. Number one, LA and Long Beach did see the drop off in the second half of last year, a precipitous drop off starting in July. It kind of went off the cliff for those two ports, but you still didn't see that on the East and Gulf Coast ports. So there's a lot of cargo coming over. Remember, 2022 is, is second only to 2021 in the most cargo ever into the United States in terms of containers. So it was record years. You had record levels in the ports of New York, New Jersey, of Savannah in Houston. So LA and Long Beach experiences. LA and Long Beach had a big first half of last year. Everything was front loaded last year. And the reason has to do with that ILWU PMA contract renegotiation, where their contract, the uh, International Longshore Warehouse Union contract expired on June 30th. And everybody wanted to get their cargo in before there was a labor dispute or a problem like happened back in 2014, 2015. The other issue is the East Coast ports and the Gulf Coast ports are more accessible than ever before 
to cargo from Asia because of two things. Number one, the new lane of the Panama Canal, the Neo Panamax lane that opened in 20, 20, 2016. Now ships going through the Panama Canal don't aren't limited to carrying four or 5,000 TEU. Now they can carry 15 to 16,000 TEU. Tremendous change. Plus a big container terminal opening up in Panama so feeder vessels can go down there. Same time, you introduce ultra-large container vessels. These are vessels of over 18,000 TEU. They don't come to the United States, but they originate in Asia heading toward Europe. They go into main transshipment hubs there in, a in Europe, and then feeder ships send them over to the United States. That's the big difference from 2014-2015 when we last saw this contract renegotiation to today. We don't necessarily factor that into to, to our thinking, 30 days for the, the Lunar New Year. Also, explain how a lack of warehouse space causes lower volumes. How does that work? All right, there are about 2 billion square feet of warehousing from the shores of the Pacific out to the desert region in, in Southern California, and they've been filled to the gills for the longest time. They can't accept more, but... It, can't accept more. This is a demand problem? Yeah, here's the other piece to it, too. While all of our numbers are starting to look better on what we call dwell times, how long containers sit before they move out to the importer or the exporter brings them back, we're still seeing dwell times of containers sitting outside storefronts and warehouses elevated beyond eight days. So let's talk about this for a second. So warehouses in the Inland Empire, just inland of the port of LA and Long Beach, are full. So you got a couple issues there. Number one, it's really hard to build warehouses in California. So putting new warehouse space up is difficult. Second, you have to take two thirds of all the cargo out of LA and Long Beach, have to get on class one railroads and head across the United States. 80% of the US population is east of a line from North Dakota to Texas. So nearly all that cargo that comes in LA and Long Beach, two thirds of it has to go east. Your class one railways are the ones that have to move them. And if you haven't noticed recently, class one railways are having a huge amount of problems, derailments, uh, scheduling issues, they have labor issues, they've gone to this precision scheduling system whereby you take a train that used to be a quarter, a half a mile long with four crew members, four crew members on board, and now you make the train two miles long with two crew members on them. Sidings aren't designed for that, which means you're pushing rail off, off one-way lines. It is making it extremely difficult to move cargo out of the West Coast into the center and eastern part of the United States. Whereas off the ports of Houston and Savannah, you can have these pop-up yards that pop up where you can store containers without a problem. You can throw up warehouses. Because understand, most shipping containers that come into the United States don't travel more than 100 miles from the port. Those containers have to be brought to a warehouse unstuffed and then repacked into 53 or, or 45 foot long trailers for shipment. Shipping them in 20 and 40 foot shipping containers is not efficient. Plus, the most of the material needs to be repacked and restowed so that it can be distributed going to warehouses and retail stores. So there's a lot going on here behind the scenes. It's not just the ocean shipping side. Normal cycle is three to four. So folks are using those containers as mobile warehouses to augment the already full brick and mortar facilities. So and this leads to another problem with him where he's talking about containers being used as storage yards. If you're a drayage driver, if you're a short haul truck driver in Southern California, number one, according to California law now, you can't use a truck that's older than 2010. So a lot of old drayage trucks went out of service here. Second, when you come in, you've got to have a chassis. You've got to have that big, huge trailer hooked up to the back of your truck, but you also need an empty container. And the problem LA has had for a long time as it's lost business here is they can't clear the empty containers out of the yard. And sometimes the yards will not receive an empty container. And if you can't get that empty container off the back of your trailer, then you can't take a full container on board. And a lot of containers and chassis have been sitting in yards and sitting in warehouses and storage areas. And you can't just roll in into a port and pick up a container without a trailer. And this causes a lot of problems. You need to follow the West Coast Trucking Association. All these guys talk about this all the time. Well, that sounds like it would be good for inflation, okay? Because it sounds like demand it. But because warehouses can charge so much, that's gonna be a persistently higher price that you have to pay to store things now. So that's gonna be net net inflationary even though they can't move things out of the warehouse it thing. could be and that's the problem with the supply chain where the bottlenecks persist you're going to see aggravated costs 
at the same time, cargo is moving away from the West Coast as well. Why is that? Re you said there's regulatory issues out there. We were just so before we get into that, I want to go back to the issue he just talked about a second ago. So understand all of this, all of this was identified in 2015. There was a f uh, Federal Maritime Commission report that looked at the ocean supply chain, the land side, the ports, uh, the, the current director of the Port of Los Angeles, uh, Mario uh, Cadero, was the uh, chairman of the Federal Maritime Commission. And they did this great report where they looked at all the potential issues in the supply chain from the port side, and they identified like 90% of all the issues. They knew, we all knew what was gonna happen when you stress the system. But little was done to address the issue, and that was the big problem. And when you don't address the issue, when you leave that issue out there, Everybody knew once you started surging cargo in, whether it's going to be big ships coming in or a lot of smaller ships coming in, you were going to stress the system. And that is exactly what happened to the ports of L.A. and Long Beach. Listen, Gene Soroka is a genius. He, he, he is, there's very few people as knowledgeable in this industry than Gene. I know I, I pick on him a lot. But he's the face of this because he does get out here a lot. And so he becomes a focus of attention on this channel. But he understood what's going on. But understand he has very little control as landlord over the tenants he has. And this is a problem we have in the United States where ports are managed by cities, municipalities, and states. There's no federal oversight of them, really. And it's hard to create national policy when each of the ports are their own little fiefdoms. At the same time, cargo is moving away from the West Coast as well. Why is that? Re you said there's regulatory issues out there. We were just talking about Gavin Newsom. Is it tough doing business? Are they driving you away to East Coast ports or driving business away? Go back to 2002. 80% of the Trans-Pacific trade moved through West Coast ports. Today, that's 56%. 50. And you get three things that importers and exporters tell me every day. Okay, he glossed over some, some facts right there. Okay, he went way in the past there for a reason because that's when his stats look good. But again, if you go up to the years leading up to COVID, what you see is a uh, drop from the West Coast heading to the East and Gulf Coast, particularly 2016 when the Panama Canal opens, the new lane, and the ultra-large container ships come online. So again, it, it's how you use the data. And Gene is very good at using his data. You're too expensive. You've got very unique labor issues, and you're overregulated. So whether it be the air regulators on trucks, how you petition to do projects and get permitting through the California Environmental Quality Act, all of that What's adds the cost to the supply price, chain. Though? What's the difference in price, Gene? So he admits right there that he has issues. He has issues with his labor, the International uh, Longshore Warehouse Union and the Pacific Maritime Association contract negotiation. And understand, they this is the making of their own. They, they made this issue. The Pacific Maritime Association is all the terminals, all the ports, and all the big shipping companies. And all the big shipping companies are awash now in money of profits from the past two years. And the smartest thing labor did was push off the contract negotiation. But the problem was they pushed it to the point right when it was ready to head off the cliff. And now labor is not in strong a position as they were. And the PMA and all the contract groups within them do not want to give more to the unions for this reason that Gene's going to talk about right now, that it is expensive to operate and run his ports on the West Coast. I mean, if, if you're looking to move a container from, I don't know, pick your place, China, to California versus the East Coast or versus another port, what, what's the cost differential? Right. The end-to-end -end prices are pretty manageable. Uh -huh. You can see them. What the difference is, is how much it costs to lift that container on and off a ship at a port. We're more than double our competitors. More than double. On the, on the Just double get the Gulf container Coast. Wow. off the okay. ship onto land. Yeah. That's the number right there, double. It is double to offload a container into the West Coast than it is into a port like Savannah where there's not labor issues, Texas in Houston where there's not, New York, New Jersey, not so much. But that's the big issue. Add to the fact that your reliability, the, the, the time it takes you to get the container out of the port and deliver it into your hands is much better in the East and Gulf Coast ports because you don't have the factors of going into the Inland Empire, finding a warehouse, 
of getting it on a class one rail, shipping it halfway across the country, you're in a much shorter distance. You can basically go to Savannah, put your, your gear on a truck and get it to right to where you need to be. You can actually bypass a lot of the issues you have. And this is the appeal that we're seeing right now in the West Coast. And what that means is the West Coast is in a really difficult position to get itself back to where it was. And I don't think it is going to shift back to the way it was. I know there was a lot of people who talked about that, that this is going to come back because of the low rates and what L.A. is going to do. They're going to reduce costs, but they can't. They're, they're really constrained by their labor costs, by their overhead they have due to regulations in California and on the West Coast, and then the transportation costs that are involved with warehousing, with repacking, with rail lines, and then trucking again. It is a difficult thing for them to overcome. All this means that, that the Gulf and East Coast ports are going to be challengers to this. We saw that LA and Long Beach almost lost their top rank to New York, New Jersey. You're going to see that continue on, especially when you see ports like Savannah, for example, which are continuing to expand and develop. I think Savannah is the big challenger coming up, but it also gives rise to second level ports to want to make inroads into this area. Ports like Charleston, Norfolk, Jacksonville, Mobile, New Orleans, all potentials for growth into this area. On the West Coast, you're constrained. Oakland really can't challenge. Seattle, Tacoma have the problem with being too far from where the populations are. Oakland, you got to get over the mountains. It's a big problem because of rail associated with that. They have labor issues in and around the port. Seattle, Tacoma, there's just not the population there to support these container ships coming in. Plus, you know, even the attempts to start a container port at Coos Bay in Oregon, you need the road and rail in there, and it's just not there. So it's going to be interesting to see how the ports of LA and Long Beach navigate this issue going forward. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell, so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment, share it across social media, give it a thumbs up, and if you can, support the page. How do you do that? You hit the super thanks button below, where you can give directly to the page, or head on over to Patreon and become a monthly or yearly subscriber. Until our next video, this is Sal, signing off.